Tonight on the big match, the battle in these early weeks for the leadership of the First Division. And tonight on the programme, the team that this morning was in first place, Ipswich Town, their visit today to Crystal Palace. Down the back they go again. Oh, my word, Billy Gilbert so close to putting it into his own net. In fact, it hit the top of the crossbar. The team that this morning was second, Southampton, their visit to Norwich. And also Liverpool against West Bromwich Albion. To the penalty area. And it's come to Lee. And Lee shoots. Good save by Gordon. Lee to try again. Header from Fairclough. And it's kicked off the line by Wilde. The major news headlines first, though, from Jim Rosenthal. Alan Clark's offered the Leeds United manager's job and we'll be talking to him later on. Everton win away for the first time in 21 matches and Manchester United find their goal touch at last with five. And later on we'll find out why this policeman's been reported to the FA. Right, the action. And we start with Crystal Palace against Ipswich at Selhurst Park. Ipswich with an amazing record of only one defeat in their last 30 league matches and Palace coming to this game one off the bottom of the first division with only troubled Leeds United beneath them. And the Palace fans, in fact, still talking of what might have been last week. Clive Allen gets a golden ball for a hat-trick he got against Middlesbrough earlier in this season, but last week he scored the goal that never was at Coventry. It hit the stanchion at the back of the goal and ricocheted into play as this Sunday Express picture shows so quickly that it fooled the referee who said no goal. Well, this week, Crystal Palace have made sure that'll never happen again at Selhurst Park, at least. The groundsman, Len Chatterton, has increased the netting in front of the stanchion, sewn it on himself, in fact, so that a shot will now be cushioned and, at least in theory, will stay in the goal. One man who found the net on Wednesday night for England, and it counted, was the Ipswich striker, Paul Mariner. Good clock and Mariner. Oh, Mariner trying to worm his way through to get a shot in. Oh, a brilliant goal by Paul Mariner. And here's Paul today, and you can be sure that another Paul will be well aware of the problems that Mariner might well pose. That's Paul Barron, the Crystal Palace goalkeeper, bought from Arsenal for £400,000. He's had 14 goals put past him already this season in the league. He's under fire from some Palace fans, and yet he maintains he's not playing badly, that the shooting has been so accurate. That's a view supported by the manager, Terry Venables. Here are the teams then. Crystal Palace make one late change. Jerry Murphy is left out. And 20-year-old Welshman Steve Lovell gets his third game of the season. He's played at fullback before. Today his job will be to mark the new England international Eric Gates. Tony Seeley is the sub. Ipswich, meanwhile, have Kevin Beattie back for the first game of the season after an operation on his right knee. And Mick Mills returns at left back after missing last week's victory over Villa and the England game on Wednesday. But Terry Butcher is out of the defence. He's got a back complaint. Certainly it's good to see Kevin Beatty back to fitness again. In fact, his recent operation on that right knee was the fourth that he had to try and clear up the trouble. Without that injury problem, I'm sure that by now he'd have been a regular for England without doubt. The referee today is Maurice Baker of Wolverhampton. Ipswich manager Bobby Robson on the left there. In fact, he's not going to see all of the game today. He'll leave just before the end to go on spy on Ipswich's European opponents, Aris of Salonika, in a game in Greece tomorrow. So Ipswich get us away in a strip of all blue, attacking the goal to our left. On a grey and a blustery day, Palace in the white. Ipswich coming as the league leaders, Palace just won off the bottom. And yet a year ago this month, they played here when Palace won 4-1 and went to the top of the first division for the first time in their history. And Ipswich at that point were languishing very close to the bottom. So a year has made a lot of difference and Palace are determined to do something about that today. Here's Billy Gilbert for them now. Walk, quite easily cutting out that one. And that blustery wind might take a little getting used to. Oh, Cannon instantly crashing into an advertisement board there. Palace captain. Gilbert, hitting it straight at Gates this time. Play towards Allen, who was well beaten in the air by Beatty. Brazil. And now Smiley. Francis. Vince Hilaire.
midfield this time for Smiley. Mills trying to get there, but Smiley got in behind him and did well there. And Beatty bringing that away quite comfortably. Palace a little puzzled by their decline this season because they feel they've been playing well. But that they've been punished for every little thing that's gone wrong. That's Lovell with a short ball here for Hilaire. Played into Flanagan. Trying to get something going, might even yet. There's a shot by him and a good save by Cooper. Well, Flanagan has scored only once this season and must have felt that number two was on its way there. Turning well. And a shot well saved by Paul Cooper. Brazil. Miran. And Lovell nicely dispossessing Gates. Sending the ball flying here to Allen. Taken nicely by him. And he put the space there for Fennec to make one of those moves forward now that Kenny Sanson used to make his own speciality when he was here. Played in this time towards Allen. Getting on the other side of Beatty and into the side netting, but I'm not at all sure there wasn't an infringement first. But he's quick and aggressive, Allen, and he really forced Ipswich into an error here. Beatty forced out of the play on the wrong side of that ball, in point of fact, and uh, into the side netting it went. Buren. Buren comprehensively beaten there by Neil Smiley. He's got Flanagan up ahead of him. Flanagan with a shot! Oh, my word! I thought we had another stanchion shot for a moment there, but that was past the post and hit the stanchion behind the goal. What a lovely piece of play by Smiley. It was his aggression that won it in the first place. Beautifully into the path of Flanagan. And now watch this. The stanchion but the wrong side. Mills, Mariner, Brazil's there, walks there, walks there again, and Ipswich are in the lead. So, Paul Barron beaten, sadly for Palace, that's the 15th time this season they've conceded a goal. And Walk is the scorer, his fifth goal of the season this one for Ipswich. Brazil, very unselfish, but it wasn't a particularly good pass, and it comes off Barron, who'd come plunging out of his goal quite rightly, and then fell quite easily for John Walk to finish it off. I was thinking up to that moment that Palace look anything but a side that's won off the bottom. They'd really carried this fight to the team at the top of the table and if anything had made the better chances. But here's Cooper. So Walk gets number five for him this season and the first of the day for Ipswich. Cannon's header. This will be Beatty. Oh, what a good ball by Beatty for Brazil. And charged out by Billy Gilbert for Crystal Palace. Lovell. Allen wanting it short, getting it. Quick turn. And a back heel that went wide of Francis. Here's Fennec, though. Hilaire. A little chip coming in. Allen on the far side. Bounce just a little too high for him. The ball's gone away, way over that wooden fence to where the big supermarket's being built. Substitute ball is on, although I gather there is something in the contract that allows a ball boy. There it is, the ball in amongst the pilings there, but I gather there is an arrangement that allows a ball boy to be there somewhere. That will be cut out by Billy Gilbert. And now Mick Flanagan. To Fennec. Flanagan. And a foul there 
by Osman. And the whistle had gone. Now, did Osman kick that away after the whistle had gone? I think he's going to get a yellow card. So one yellow card for something that Mariner said. A yellow card for Osman for kicking the ball away. Osman, you lip read the name. Francis then with the free kick. Lost a lot of weight, Jerry Francis, over a stone. Holding that one in there. Fennick almost made something of that, fisted away there as Francis takes it up again. Hilaire playing it in, goal kick. <laughs> Half-time whistle and the top of the table team, Ipswich, go in with a one-goal lead. Goal being scored by John Walk, who probably has been their best player in this first half. He's covered so much through the midfield. He's got in some tackling right at the back, and he's really linked up so well with the men at the front and was bravely in there with that header that provided Ipswich with the only goal of the first half. Ipswich looking so well balanced, and Palace looking at the moment a little short on confidence. And a half-time score here then at Selhurst Park that is Crystal Palace nil, Ipswich one. So Palace get us away then at the start of the second half, attacking the goal to our left in the white strip. Needing to find their way through this Ipswich defence in this second half. Ipswich, in fact, who have conceded only two goals in the first five league games this season scored 14 certainly in that first half they showed every reason for being at the top of the first division very fluent and mobile display and good all-round teamwork and as you can see with only two goals conceded they're pretty mean about it as well but here's Lovell leaving it now for Smiley can Palace find a way through here's Francis that shot was blocked and Allen almost got through, but in fact the flag was up on the far side for an infringement before Flanagan uh, got possession there. Smiley again. Mistake by Muren. Got a confidence about him, and here's Hinchelwood now. With the cross coming in there towards Clive Allen, he was buffeted down, he looked hopefully towards the referee who spread his arms wide, and Tyson takes it away. Past Jerry Francis. Early again, making a breakdown here for Ipswich. Played in first time towards Paul Mariner. And Gates is in behind them. And somehow Palace got it away. But what a beautiful, flowing move again by Ipswich. And here's Fennick. Tyson. Tyson still. And I think for a moment he's going to get on for left foot for a shot. Instead of that, he gives it to Gates. Around the back they go again. Oh, my word, Billy Gilbert so close to putting it into his own net. In fact, it hit the top of the crossbar. Well, it's a corner, of course, and Gates, a couple of times in the last couple of minutes, has showed his speed and agility. He whipped that one back from the byline, and look at that, off the top of the crossbar. Floated deep towards Beatty. Brazil, little turn. Looking to get round the back there again, and Baron was quickly out. Francis just finding the level. Now Smiley. It's Hilaire. Played back by Flanagan a little too firmly for Clive Allen. But there's his little chip coming in towards Steve Lovell. He's right in there. And Tyson in the end had to duck down and head that one away. Cooper, 
again. Cannon has come forward. And again, Mariner is right back there to keep an eye on the big palace number five. But it's Hilaire, again, floating it towards the near post. Kick back there, Cannon! And Cooper grabbing it as Allen came in. But that little near post flick from corners, it's an old trick, but it still seems to work, and it very nearly worked for Palace there. Floated in by Hilaire. It was Terry Fennick who got that one in, and then the header by Jim Cannon, grabbed by Paul Cooper. Getting to the point where they need maybe to push people forward a little more, but it's Mariner doing just that now for Ipswich. Cannon coming across to try and pull him down, and that was extraordinary. The referee looked hard at that, and he actually had his whistle in his mouth for a moment, and then thought better of it. Well, in fairness to the referee, he had a good long look at this one. He actually had his whistle in his mouth. And then in fairness to him, he thought again about it, and he felt that that was a dive by Mariner, and I think there was a certain amount of evidence to suggest that that was so. Played there for Gates to go, and uh, Lovell followed him well, and Lovell will claim that he took the ball there, but the referee claims that he also took Eric Gates. So Ipswich get a free kick. Certainly the case that if Eric Gates was injured there, there is the feeling that some pros would say he should be wearing shin pads. But Gates, as you can see, the number 11 there, his socks as his ankles, as they have been from the very first minute of the game. Four men in the Palace wall. And played there for Kevin Beatty to blister a ball and Barron saved that in fact superbly because he hit it tremendously hard in Beatty. Barron just got a fingertip to it, touched it off onto the post, over it went, but I got a feeling it may have to be taken again. And the referee's having a word there. There's Barron pushing it up onto the crossbar. All for nothing. The referee is getting a round booing from the crowd here. Maybe he hadn't whistled for it to start, I don't know, but there's the same thing happening again, but this time Palace charge it down, that shot from Beatty. And Tony Seeley warming up, I think, as though he will shortly be on. Flanagan's header, walk back. Scored the only goal of the game in the first half. Brazil touching it for Mariner. Now for Gates. Oh, Gates. And that's number two. Beautifully taken by Eric Gates. And that really will fill off anything the Palace can offer. Well, he was saying that Wednesday night playing his first game for England was the greatest moment of his life. He scored one or two pretty spectacular goals in the last year or two. I heard he hit that one well. Suddenly it all came clear here for Eric Gates as he went wide of the last Palace defender. Right foot, cracking shot there, just in under the crossbar. 2-0 to Ipswich. And Eric Gates, the scorer. I think Paul Barron is still thinking, well, I don't know what I've done wrong, but I, mean, I think the two goals here today, there wasn't much he could have done about them, certainly that second one. in there for Allen, or oh, chance now, and saved well by Cooper, and he couldn't get a second go at it. But suddenly, uh, Clive Allen looked to be in a good scoring position there, and it was a fine piece of keeping by Paul Cooper. Cannon leaping up there, but he couldn't get high enough. Smiley looking for something on the turn, and a goal by Lovell! That's his first goal, and it probably has come too late. The question really was as to whether Clive Allen, I think it would have been in front of him, was would have been in an offside position. But it was a fair old scramble there, Smiley's shot. And the ball whacked into the back of the net, and it could have been that Seeley on the other side was offside. The referee's being called to Kevin Beatty about something there. Well, 
There have been a few names in the book today for things that people have said. But I don't think Beatis went in. What did go in was the goal which made it 2-1 now to Ipswich. But it's in time added on, and it could well be too little, little too late. Well, a last forlorn hope here by Crystal Palace, and it's all over. It's Ipswich who've got the two points. The goal by Eric Gates, five minutes from the end, really the one that killed off any hope Palace had of restoring something from the game. Even though Steve Lover, with his first goal in the league right at the end, gave them that just that flickering hope. But of course, John Walks header setting it up for Ipswich in the first half. So there's no question that Ipswich will stay at the top of the first division tonight. And Palace still have one or two worries at the other end of the field. So a final score then here at Selhurst Park. It's Crystal Palace 1, Ipswich 2. So it goes without saying that Ipswich, looking so well balanced and so confident, in fact, keep their place at the top of the first division tonight. I'll not show you the top of the table now because it'll give the game away for our other matches tonight. But I can show you, sadly, that Crystal Palace now are at the bottom of the first division, with Leeds United having gained a point today against Spurs. However, the Palace manager, Terry Venables, told me afterwards that this was the first time that he felt that Palace had played badly this season and that his players had felt for sorry for themselves after that first Ipswich goal. What did he mean by that? I just felt as if the, the team, you know, started off quite sprightly, full of confidence and played away. And then when it didn't break for us, I thought they, they as the game went on, they felt, felt they wasn't going to do it. And they just felt a bit down and thought... It's not for us today, which, and that's the last time I want to see that because you've got to fight right the way through if we're going to make it happen. That's a deficiency in the side, really, isn't it? The one that sort of, as it were, gives up. Yeah, it's a deficiency in any side. I mean, we've not had that. I, I felt that that was there today. Um, and if they give 90 minutes of 100% um, effort and it goes wrong for them, I'll accept that. Uh, but I didn't feel that that was true today. And did you tell them that afterwards, that they hadn't really given you all that they should have done? No, I don't very often talk about the game afterwards because I remember myself, the, the players are still in the game and then a lot of heated things are said. As long as um, I don't lose the points um, when the thing is cooled down, I would prefer to speak about it 40 hour, 48 hours later. Because yes. the temptation there is to say that, that good players have become bad players in a matter of a few months, which of course is not necessarily the case. But no. they are different players. They're not, they're not in fact reacting in, uh, as winning players. Now that's what you're saying, isn't it? Um, yeah, all these things when you're not doing well, it, it starts to chink at your mind. At, you know, am I a good player? Perhaps I'm not. Things are not going well. I'm not playing well. But we've we've got to try and cut that bad thinking away. So we're down to the good thinking. And the good thinking is that game today is gone. We must learn from it. We must improve and put better thinking into the next game. That's my job to make sure that they do that. And uh, and it's their job then to perform for the 90 minutes. Last season you were described as a team of the 80s. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't look that way at the moment. Well, I mean, again, I think that's silly uh, from your point of view to say it doesn't look like that. I mean, we've had a bad start. It's not, it's not 89, 90, is it? It's 80, 80, 81. It's still at the beginning and we're all going to have our problems in life. And uh, we can still up, end up at the end of the first year in the 80s doing well. We've had a bad start, that's all. But is there a case that some people are saying that maybe that you took them all by surprise last year with this very talented young side, but now you've been rumbled? I mean, is there anything in that? I, I don't know. I'm not really interested in what people are saying. All I'm interested in is making sure that we keep our feet on the ground and we um, don't take too much notice of the people that are saying the wrong things. If people are saying the right things, well, I'd like to take notice of them. Yes. Is there a question of you looking now for other players to no. improve the position? No, not at all. No. I think we've got the players here. I, I think um, the boy Walk does a good cleaning up job for Ipswich. He sits in front of the back four, does a good job. And we've got, I think, one of the best in the country, that Peter Nicholas. He's only 20, but he's experienced in his mind and he's a good player. I, I think we miss him. He's no, I think there's no... Now, he's uh, injured. How soon are you going to get him back? Uh, well, he has his plaster off his ankle. He fractured his ankle at the beginning of the season. He has the plaster off on Tuesday. We're hoping he'll be fit in about 10 days after that, with a bit of luck. Because things, in many ways, are looking brighter here on the financial side, aren't they? Oh, excellent. I mean, uh, in, f in four years, when, when we came here, 
uh, when I came here rather, we were, I think it was about 1.6 million of debt. We're now on even terms. We've come up two divisions and things have gone very well for me. Excellent. Um, and you were 1.6 million in debt? That's what I believe. Yeah. I mean, I'm not 100% sure about that. Yeah. That was roughly the, the figures. I know, that, I know um, things were very, very difficult all around the club at that time. There were lots of bills and things, which the club had pulled itself together and done well. Now, as I say, the telephone bill. Oh, the telephone got cut, up, cut off the first day I was in. I thought, well, that's lovely, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, I thought, I kind of couldn't even pay the telephone bill. That's right. But as I said, it's gone excellent for me in four years. It's gone, it, we've had a bad start of six games. Now we'll see what I'm made of. And? Well, we'll see, won't we? <laughs> you think what? I know what I think. That's all, that That's all that matters to me. Tell me what, what you I think. think. Um, I, well, I, I know that uh, if you have a bad start, and if I think you know you're good at your job, I think that you'll win it round, and that's what I believe. And I tend to agree with him as well. Terry Venables, the manager of Crystal Palace. <laughs> Our second match today, though, we go to Norwich for the visit of Southampton, who started the day in second place to Ipswich on goal difference. For Southampton, the good news was that Charlie George was back in the side, but the bad news was that Kevin Keegan was still out with hamstring trouble. So Norwich against Southampton, the pictures from Anglia Television, and Norwich in the lighter shirts. Free kick to Southampton with Watson coming up. Fashion who stays with him there. Baker on the ball. In for Shannon, this side, he wasn't picked up too quickly, and a difficult one with Fashionu getting it out. All the Norris were in big trouble there. That free kick was driven short to Shannon. Punched across the face of the goal, and they were in trouble from here. Norwich really were quite happy to see Fashionu get that away. Nickel here. Shannon, Patton to Gogol turning away well against Nickel. It's one against one here. Gogol might get one over and Pashadu. Right in on the end of it where it counts. Gogol made it with a really penetrating run down that left hand side. A simple cross, one that defenders hate. And rushing in on that far post and whack. There's Fashionu, 1 0. Fashionu trying to get into the penalty area, leaving space here for Woods. Behind Padden. Mark Byram's over the far side. This is Mujinitz again. Nice return. Padden trying to get through himself. the corner it is and Fashionu gets himself to the other side of the penalty box with Bond on the near post Woods there too Bond there and Fashionu headed away by McCartney amazing history McCartney last year he was playing for third division Carlisle and when somebody said Southampton were interested in him he just laughed Totally got that, but it's Southampton who get the free kick. Pulling Fashionu back here because Watson is pushing forward as Holmes shapes for this one. Williams is right up. Even Nickel coming up. In for Nickel and Channon. Oh, gracious me. Terrible heart stopping moment there for Hansbury and for Norwich City Holmes is kick it's a good one it gives Southampton a clear header but it should have given the goalkeeper a clear side of the ball but only just and Woods here again against McCartney it's a good cross and Golak clears well Southampton have had to clear in extremis on about four times this first half and Wales will be pleased by that. Another corner. Again, Bond and Hoadley on that near post. Bond up there. Barham. Oh, a drive. Oh, oh 
desperately unlucky, Mike Barham. And it's Southampton to break away. Boyer beaten by Powell. And let's have a look at that one again. No doubt about it. As the ball came out, Mark Barham whacks that through the gaggle of players, thunders against that post, and the goalkeeper never sniffed it. The Norwich City substitute in there, warming up, but meanwhile, Goebel's on the way to drive one in here. Well, Goebel, above anyone else, has been so close to locking up the points for Norwich City in the first and second half. That's certainly his best move in the second half. Meanwhile, a substitution and a great round of applause for Mark Barham coming off. And the man to come on is Peter Mendham, one midfield player for another. Peter Mendham going here. Oh, here's Goebel. Good, brave goalkeeping. Patton still in business. Goebel again. Down he goes, no foul. And Southampton get it away, but not very far. Well, once again, Norris said he had that opportunity to open up the gap and score that vital second goal. Bond gets it again. This is a real battling show. And Goebel takes it away from his man superbly. He's on his own. Behind him, he's got Woods. Goebel going alone. And bundled off it. It's a corner. Holmes protests. Well, the action really is going from one end to the other in the shortest possible way, the quickest possible time. Still the protests aimed towards a referee by Charlie George. Well, what on earth was going on there? Charlie George involved with the photographer behind that goal. And I can only assume that Charlie must have felt that the photographer was going to keep hold of that ball and he wanted to get it away from him and get back into the action again and uh, Nick Holmes is looking around here unaware of what's going on but you can see now behind there the action really gets going as the photographer is very incensed with something that's going on there Charlie George deeply involved in it and overall a very unsavoury scene more of that a little later on our commentator there incidentally was Jerry Harrison and Norwich were the winners 1-0 which means that Southampton fall two points behind Ipswich but now let's see who's been making the news on a national basis with Jim Rosenthal. Brian, there's no doubt about that. It's Alan Clark who's been offered the job as Leeds United manager, just as we predicted and on the ball this lunchtime. Clark, now with Barnsley, is the man the Leeds directors have chosen to succeed Jimmy Adamson. Alan's in our Yorkshire studio now with Martin Tyler. Alan, we know you've been officially approached now by Leeds United. What exactly is the position at the moment tonight? Well, the position, uh, Martin, is that uh, my directors have given given Leeds directors the permission to talk to me. And obviously I will be having a chat with the Leeds, Leeds board over the weekend. Have you accepted the job yet? No. No, I would, uh, I would think, as I say, I, I will listen to what they have to say to me. And uh, I will give them a quick reply, sort of probably Monday night, because, as I say, I'm still employed by Barnsley Football Club. We have a game on Monday night at Brentford. If we win that, we go top of the league. So, um, as I say, I will let my deci decision be known on Monday night because I think that if I do go, I think my players, my backroom staff, my board of directors, I think they're the people who should know first about my decision. Can you give us any indication of what that decision is likely to be? Well, not at, not at this moment, uh, Martin, until I've uh, met the uh, Leeds board. What reservations do you have, Alan? Because I understand you said after the game tonight, Barnsley's game against Huddersfield, that you wanted to be assured that money would be available. Now, we know Leeds United are a club with a lot of financial problems. Could well, that be a stumbling block? It could be. Um, I think, obviously, um, if I decide to take the job, and I say it's all ifs and buts at the moment, um, obviously, the players are already down there, and let's be fair, there's, there's a lot of talent down there. Uh, but having said that, you know, I've got to have money to spend if I feel uh, the team needs strengthening. 
You've only been a manager for two years. Do you really feel you're experienced enough to go into a job as difficult as Leeds United's proved to be? I never think. You never think in this game, Martin. I know I can do the job. Well, that's a very confident Alan Clark there, so he'll be making up his mind on Monday. No doubt about the shock of the day, Everton's 2-0 win at Aston Villa, their first away from home for more than a year. Captain Mick Lyons and Peter Easto got those goals. Easto diving in bravely for a header. He cut his head and needed six stitches. Manchester United carved up Leicester at Old Trafford. United won 5-0 and until today United had only scored four in seven matches. First points of the season for Swindon, and they're off the bottom of the third division after beating Rotherham 2-1. And Southend have lost their 100% record. They were held to a goalless draw at Hereford. Well, now the strangest story of the day. It happened at Colchester. A policeman stopped play by walking onto the pitch, complaining that Millwall's Mel Blythe was inciting crowd trouble by swearing. But it was the policeman who copped it from the referee, Howard Taylor. Mr Taylor said later, he'd be reporting the officer to the FA. And as for Mel Blythe, well, he did swear, but he told us tonight it was only in the heat of the moment. The result, by the way, Colchester won 3-0. Brian? Well, coming up next, Liverpool against West Bromwich Albion, and that's some action not to be missed, some great stuff. <laughs> Well, Ipswich might be at the top, and they're worth it. Southampton are close by, and they've got their best team for a long time. But there's no doubting the side they all fear. It's Liverpool. And today, Liverpool were due for quite a test as they came face-to-face -face with West Bromwich Albion, who were lying six in the table at the start of the day. Liverpool against West Brom, then, with the pictures from Granada, the commentator Gerald Sinstadt. But let's first hear from the Albion manager, Ron Atkinson, on what he expects from his key men today. Peter Barnes' responsibility today will be to, to, uh, to attack Philip Neal um, with his pace, his control, and try and uh, keep Neal so occupied defending that he doesn't have a chance to break forward against us and build up attacks. Brian Robson will play a slightly different role to the one he did for England in midweek. He'll sweep behind our two central defenders. His main job will be to, uh, to give them some insurance against their strikers, and also um, another responsibility he will have will be to look for uh, McDermott breaking into our box. And when we look at the West Bromwich lineup, we can see why Brian Robson's role as sweeper is crucial. Because fullbacks Brendan Batson and Derek Statham are being encouraged to push up to reinforce midfield rather than asking a striker to drop back. Liverpool's formation is tried, tested, and unchanged. But some faces change today. Alan Kennedy, Jimmy Case, and David Johnson are all injured. Harvey Cohen, Sammy Lee, and David Fairclough come in with no suggestion from manager Bob Paisley that this is necessarily just a one-off operation. Today's referee is Mr Trelford Mills from Barnsley, only recently back in action after having been out since last December with an Achilles tendon injury. And it's West Bromwich Albion who kick off, attacking the cock goal to our right. Broad black and white stripes and white shorts Liverpool in their usual order. Doug Leash. Foul given against Doug Leash on Robson, who lost a boot in the skirmish. A short hold up while the Brian Robson gets dressed again. And now Mr. Mill says, Come on, let's have the free kick. Thompson. Soonest to Kennedy. Dog leash to Kennedy. Dermot through the middle. Fairclough. And Doug Leash. Let it run for Lee. Superb move by Liverpool. And so nearly a goal as they opened up the West Brom defence. Moses now for West Bromwich, but that's too hard for Regis. 
but there was a marvellous move here with some quick first-time passes by Liverpool and Dalglish's half dummy half flick and it needed all of Gordon's agility to block Lee and Thompson no handball Soonis Cohen Kennedy by Robson Robson still pairing after the ball he cleared himself originally Hansen off Statham for a Liverpool shot Leash has won the corner. Bill Thompson just coming into the penalty area at the top of that picture. Kind of corner, cleared only as far as McDermott. And his attempt is blocked. Lee to try once more. Gordon coming for the punch, which he didn't make. And that is handball and a penalty. Robson fisted it over when it was heading for the net. Header from Fairclough and Robson's left hand clearly deflects it over the bar. No booking for the deliberate handball, but a penalty for Terry McDermott to take. Scored from the spot for England at Wembley on Wednesday. Scores from the spot here. Gordon knew which way it was going, but could do nothing about it. Jerry McDermott's trusty right foot. Gordon actually got hands to it, but still couldn't keep it out. So, Jerry McDermott... Puts Liverpool one in front. Incidentally, the goals that Terry McDermott got at Wembley on Wednesday were his first for England. Leash just touched away from him by Robson. McDermott stretching, Soonis, Thompson. Soonis. Aim for McDermott, but Owen did well. And has made himself some room and Played it for Barnes to chase. Good play there by Owen. Now Barnes got stopped by Hansen. Owen coming in again. And really Ray Clements has not had a lot to do. But there's a yellow card shown now. I think to McDermott. Calling the West Brom trainer on to have a look at Owen. And the foul that caused the injury... And Terry McDermott, a yellow card. It's a 50-50 ball, and clearly studs showing from Terry McDermott. Certainly uh, isn't going to take any immediate part in the game, although ten minutes from half-time there may be a temptation by West Bromwich to see whether he can recover Robson with the free kick and Regis is header and a good save from Clements that was a very good header and a typical Ray Clements save having been out of action for so much of the half then suddenly showing tremendous reflex skills fine header and a good touch over Almost bringing Cyril Regis a goal. Moses with the corner. Looked like a handball there. In a crowd of players and maybe not spotted or maybe deemed accidental. Here's Fairclough. Batson just uh, got a somewhat fortuitous boot to that. But Fairclough has certainly been uh, posing a few problems there. 
and all three of the players who've come into the Liverpool side as replacements today can feel well pleased with their performance in this first half. It's come out to Moses, but well intercepted by Thompson. Soonis, and he's found Fairclough well. Cohen is forward. Dalglish trying to find McDermott. Regis, Statham, Thompson, Cohen. McDermott just gliding it on. Dalglish a good turn. And 2-0 through Graham Soonis. And once again, West Bromwich will be wondering how their defence is actually working because it was right through the middle. Dalglish gets it through, and there is Soonis coming in. Gordon Powerless. And Robson, I suppose, will be asking himself whether he shouldn't have been there to stop it. Dalglish, who managed to get it through. Soonis, who got the goal. to Barnes and Barnes crosses well and just a fingertip by Clements was enough it really was only a fingertip Neil and there's the half-time whistle goals by McDermott and Soonis send Liverpool in with the lead and a mixed afternoon for two of England stars in midweek McDermott a penalty and a booking and in his sweeper's role, Brian Robson having a rather difficult afternoon. So Liverpool lead 2-0 at half-time. <laughs> 2 nil then to Liverpool, and 45 minutes of this game still to go. They've already scored 13 goals in three and a half games at Anfield this season. Hansen. Robson. But, uh, hit Fairclough, but he reacted very quickly. Kennedy. Dermott. Side given McDermott trying to get on the end of Soonis's pass. Robson. Stay them. Going his own way and looking for a shot. Sort of Peter Barnes that we often saw at Main Road. It has to be said that since he moved to the Hawthorns, Peter Barnes' uh, scoring ratio has improved quite considerably. The attendance is only moderate, 36,792. It's the lowest of five visits that Albion have made since they were promoted. The last three visits have been around 50,000. And under chased by Dalglish. Fairclough stays in the middle. Dalglish recovers his balance miraculously and crosses. And that is a fine goal by Fairclough. Brave and deservedly rewarded with a goal. Kenny Dalglish coming to have a look. 
He did so much good work. Look how quickly he's back on his feet and balanced. Threads over the cross and down goes Fairclough to score. Fairclough is all right again. The scorer of Liverpool's third goal and a very good one it was too. Good contribution made by Dalgleish. Midway through the second half, and Liverpool thoroughly in command again. Did the double over West Brom last season with four goals from uh, Johnson, who didn't uh, play today, of course. Liverpool slowing things down at the back there. Perhaps mindful that uh, they've got their first game in this season's European Cup competition to come on Wednesday. They're off to Finland to play Ulun Palaseora. Cohen. Fairclough. McDermott. Dalgleish. Fairclough could well be number four and is. If West Brom thought that uh, Liverpool had declared, that will have disabused them. Fairclough, step over by McDermott, then Dalgleish, then Fairclough, and it all looks so simple. David Fairclough, two goals in about four minutes. And Dalgleish involved again. Dermott's contribution, a little dummy. Brown down for Truick, and Truick over the top. And Liverpool want to make a substitution. They're going to take off Alan Hansen. And Richard Money will come on to make his first division debut. Money signed from Fulham in May for £300,000. Gets his first game in the first division. Curiously, it was seven years ago this week that he made his league debut in the fourth division, also as a substitute. Then it was for Scunthorpe against Peterborough. Regis. That's Regis. Trick. And here's Barnes. Should have scored and would have scored had Clemens not been so fast to come out. There's a clear chance there as that ball suddenly came to Barnes in a lot of space, but look how quickly Clements was out. Dermot. Offside, no. Statham was playing uh, Dalgleish on. Bearclough is in the middle. Lee is at the back of the penalty area. And it's come to Lee, and Lee shoots. Good save by Gordon. Lee to try again. Header from Fairclough, and it's kicked off the line by Wilde. Almost number five. It was a good save in the middle of it all from Gordon, but in the end, it was real perils of falling stuff for West Bromwich's defence. That's Lee. That was Gordon's save. It's Lee again. There's a header there from Fairclough. Dalgleish was coming in but while save the day we are now playing the time that uh, Mr Mills has added on and there's not to be much of it Liverpool have beaten West Bromwich Albion by four goals to nil thanks to a fine all-round performance but some very distinguished play by all three players drafted into the side. They're going to be difficult to drop, and none more than David Fairclough, scorer of two of the goals. So a brilliant Liverpool performance there, and there they are lying in third place. If we can look at the top of the table there, Ipswich first, Southampton second, and we've seen all three of those clubs on the big match tonight. Just arrived now, the early editions of the Sunday papers, and the news of the world. First of all, we feature, and in fact, they feature the incident with Charlie George and that photographer at Norwich, which we've also seen. The paper claims that George made an apology to the photographer, who it's alleged threatened court action unless he received one. Laurie McMenemy said, Charlie thought the photographer was going to keep the ball. He's done the right thing now, and that's the end of the matter as far as I'm concerned. 
Meanwhile, in the Sunday Mirror, Kevin Keegan says, don't be so silly, Willie. And he's referring to Willie Whitelaw. In an open letter, Kevin accuses the Home Secretary of passing the buck over crowd violence. He says footballers have been blamed for mistakes others, including the government, have made and challenges Mr Whitelaw to meet him. And that's it. Tonight on The Big Match, we've been able to bring you the very best from the First Division, the matches that really mattered at the top today. And with them, victories for Ipswich and for Liverpool. They've kept on the winning path, all right, and they've done it by playing attacking football. And along the way, both teams produce spectacular goals. Eric Gates for Ipswich, David Fairclough for Liverpool. Good night from us all. Brazil touching it for Mariner. Now for Gates. Oh, Gates. And that's number two. Fairclough. McDermott. Dalgleish. Fairclough could well be number four, and is.